So, if, we'll see. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to turn to Psalm 89. We'll take a pause on the book of James for this morning. I'd look, like to look at Psalm 89. Take a moment just to turn there. In my reading of this psalm, I would say the context of it is this is going to take place significantly after the days of David. I had to guess uh, it would be during the period of captivity, uh, and that's based on one of the verses that describes David's uh, crown being thrown down to the dust. Okay? So this psalm is written at a period of extreme hardship. One that we can't really fathom here, but to give you a similar modern day comparison, imagine you were one of those Ukrainian citizens, Russia has invaded and they have captured you and carried you back to Russia. That's happening to folks. Okay? That's what it was like in the captivity. That's your context, most likely, for when this psalm is being written. And our natural reaction to that kind of scenario, if you're anything like me, may be a bit of grumbling, a little mully grubbing, a little, Lord, what's your problem? You know, kind of bad to say it out loud, but maybe we think that. Things aren't going how I think they ought to. This is pretty bad, Lord. Where are you? But I want you to listen to this psalm and see what the psalm spends the vast majority of his time doing. Because starting in verse 1 of 89, that's Psalm 89, all the way down to 37, we'll call this part 1, 1 through 37, he is praising... He is worshiping, and he is reciting God's promises. Now, the whole thing is 52 verses. The first 37, in the time of great trial, affliction, and misery beyond our, our you know, spoiled understanding here, is a praise, worship, and acknowledgement of God's promises. Part 2 would start in verse 38 and go down to 45, and that's going to describe their present situation. Just a, a, a citing. This is what's going on, Lord. And then 46 to 51 is the, is the request, the supplication, the asking for help. And then the last verse goes back to praise. Returns to praise. All right? That's kind of our brief overview. So let's jump into it. Psalm 89 a mashil of Ethan the Ezraite. Mashil is a didactic poem. That means a poem with a moral lesson. There's instruction. Okay. Who exactly Ethan the Ezraite is? There are several, um, but neither one um, that I've found fits into the timeline of being this far past David. Um, so it just may be a descendant of Ethan. Uh, the original Ethan was a, a grandson of Tamar. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. What was our context? Right. Trials and tribulations in our context. That's what he's living in. And the first thing he's doing is, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Does that include right now? Yeah. Yeah. Are mercies. Mercies are the kindnesses. Loving kindness is sometimes translated. The pity, the gentleness, the kindness of the Lord. There are many, 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 many mercies that we are experiencing every day. Even in the midst of trials, hardship, and affliction. And the first thing he's doing is he's, he's going to acknowledge that. He's going to sing. He's going to praise Him. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. His mercies are, ever, are unending. And so you've got something to sing about for forever, both now and eternity. The mercies of the Lord. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness. Okay? I've got some actively 
praise coming out of my face, right? In seeing and in telling with my mouth, I'm going to let known the faithfulness to all generations. Again, it's the same concept of forever. I'm going to be bragging on God, on His mercies and on His faithfulness to all generations, those who are actively around now, whether they're older or younger, and all the way through time, because I'm going to be with God for forever, praising His mercy, His kindness, and praising His faithfulness, His firmness, His security. He's trustworthy. That's the two themes in this psalm, is God's mercy and His faithfulness. There is no mercy like God's mercy, and there is no one faithful like God is faithful. Regardless of what you're going through, you've got something to brag on God about, about who God is, right? We talk about those four buckets, right? Well, I'm going to focus today on that bucket of, of worshiping God, right? Well, what, what do you need to worship Him about? Who He is. He is faithful. He is the definition of faithful. There is no one faithful like our God, and He's faithful to you individually. And He is merciful. He's merciful to you individually. So do you have something to sing about when we come in here? Yeah. yeah. You have something to sing about when you go out there? Yeah. Yes. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. All right. I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. All right. Built up to build, to establish. God's mercy is not going to stop. It continues to be built and to be built and to be built and to be built. Every day you're experiencing an additional layer of God's mercy. It continues for forever. His loving kindness, it's unending. And it may be easy for that to say. You say, okay, preacher, we get that. Move on. No, wrap your head around it because you can't. Your head ain't that big, right? Our mind <laughs> you know, it can only go so far, right? You try and imagine infinity. You ever get to that in math where you're like, okay, how do I get to the infinite number? Well, God's mercy goes on for forever. It's constantly being built and built and built for forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish or to set up or to erect in the very heavens. Thy faithfulness. Mercy and faithfulness. What is something that's been established in the heavens that is of an infinite kindness and is infinitely stable? Your inheritance. Uncorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away. What better example than you being with Him in glory. It's established in the heavens. It's His faithfulness that's going to bring you there. Right? How faithful and how loving kindness... How, how great is that loving kindness? How faithful is He? He has been faithful to you since before He started the first star, before He made the earth, anything. Before creation, He knew your name. And He has been faithful in His love and His mercy to you all the way through to where He's going to bring you, to where He's going to continually demonstrate perfectly that love and faithfulness and glory. That's the faithfulness of the God you have. That's how merciful He is. That's how kind He is to you. It stretches throughout eternity to you. Verse 3 shifts the speaker. You're no longer the Psalms. He is now quoting God. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David, my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. So our Psalms this year is quoting God. He's saying, God, this is something you've said. I've made a covenant with my chosen. Did he choose David? You better believe it. He chose him specifically. Right? He sent Samuel, go anoint a specific one. It's going to be a son of Jesse. You have them all lined up. Nope, 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 nope. Is there any more? Yeah, I got one. He's back watching the sheep. Go fetch him. This is the one that I've chosen. He anointed him. Just the same way that he chose Saul. Right? God specifically chose him by name. Y'all, he chose you the same way. He chose you the same way. He knew you. 
before you existed, before you knew you, before your mama knew you. He knew you, chose you by name. I have made a covenant with my chosen. All right? He made a promise to David, a covenant, something that will not be broken. I have sworn unto David, my servant, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. Pause. Think on that. All right, let's think on that. Let's go to 2 Samuel and see when he did that. This is in the life of King David. David had the idea, I really want to build a temple. He wanted to build a permanent structure for the ark. Because at this point, all through the history of Israel, since the law had been given and the ark had been built, it had been housed in tents. Right? The original tent, and then later David would build a new tent there at Jerusalem. That was where it was housed. Um, and so he's talking to Nathan the prophet, says, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the God dwelleth in curtains. And Nathan, you know, he says, basically says, Sounds like a good idea to me. The Lord's with you. Go ahead. And then the Lord came and talked to Nathan and told him, No, that's not how it's going to work. You know, I've set up David, but he's not going to be the one to build the house. Um, and instead, he said, I'm going to build David's house. Okay, go down to verse 11. Um, okay. I'm sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 7. And you can read the whole chapter for full context of, of the vision of David, and uh, Nathan, rather. So Nathan's going to go and tell him, uh, since the time I commanded judges to be over Israel and cause thee to rest from all thine enemies, and also the Lord telleth thee, God telling David, he will make thee a house. David wanted to make a house for God. Nope, I'm going to make you a house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This will be Solomon. I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. So God had chosen Saul. Saul had disobeyed on numerous occasions and God took away that mercy, took it away from his household and gave it to another, gave it to David. He's saying, it's not going to be like that. If, his, if your sons disobey me, I will chasten them, but I'm not going to completely withdraw this covenant from them. All right, like he did with Saul. Verse 16, And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Okay? According to all these words and according to the vision, so did Nathan speak to David. Right? How is David's throne fulfilled and being established forever? By Jesus Christ. That's the throne that by right he had through bloodlines and through adoptive fathers, right? He had the right to David's throne, and he sits on it today. That's how that is fulfilled. So he made that promise. I've chosen, uh, I've made a covenant with my chosen. Go back to Psalm 89. I made a covenant with my chosen. I've sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne for all generations. Say law. So that throne is going to go on for all generations. The psalmist here who's going through this trial and affliction doesn't yet see that full picture, right? They had things revealed to them that even they didn't understand, and it's only now having the full revelation we can go back and see what it's pointing to. So he's, he's, he's quoting God saying, you said it was going to you know, be built up for all generations. Pause, right? And then he's going to continue on with praise, right? And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, the faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. All right, so we're, we're in trials, and now he's acknowledging the heavens themselves praise God's works. In Job, we hear about uh, the morning stars saying, that was one of the things he asked Job, where were you when the morning stars sang? The morning stars sing praises to God, right? The hills and the mountains and uh, all creatures are praising God actively. The heavens shall praise thy wonders. O Lord, Lord, all caps there, Jehovah, the eternal God, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. Well, that's implied there is if the heavens are praising what's going on in the congregation, they're praising God for his faithfulness. Right? The saints have a special insight into the faithfulness of God. It's applied to them differently than all creation. Guess what? Creation is going to be folded up like a garment and put away. He's going to make something new. 
But His children, His saints, they have a faithfulness that will never go. It's enduring. It's stable. It's firm. In the midst of tribulation, I can still praise and rejoice in the truth of God's stability. I can praise Him in the congregation, in the assembly of the saints. That's what the church is. The called out assembly. You have been called out of the world to come and assemble together and to praise God together. That's what we're trying to do this morning. We're trying to praise God. Verse 6, that's a question. For who in heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Okay, Heaven, you've got celestial beings, you've got seraphims, you've got angels, you've got these things that are mightier in power and in strength and in knowledge, and they, they, they don't die since they've been created. But can any of them be compared to God? No! Right? Much less us, who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord. Nothing. There is nothing that can be compared to God, to His might, to His strength. Boys, imagine you throw a rock straight up in the air. One of you is a little bit stronger, you throw it up a little bit higher, right? Now imagine you can't toss that rock, and now you imagine you launch a rocket ship that goes to the moon. That gives you a little bit of the scale about our abilities versus... Except for God's rocket ship would never stop, right? I don't care how strong you are, that rock's eventually going to come back down. God's rock don't have to. All right? Well, who can compare to Him? Nobody. Do you have something worthy of praise? You better believe it. Y'all, we hold God in too low esteem. We need to raise our view of God. Now, it's going to be beyond where we can really see or comprehend or fathom, but we need to raise the esteem that we hold God with. He is way higher than we can comprehend, than we can think. But he's worthy of praise for who He is. Much less for what He's done for us. That's wonderful in and of itself. But even if He hadn't, He's still worthy of our praise. There's nothing that no one can compare to Him. Not among the, in the heaven, nor among the sons of the mighty can be likened to Him. Verse 7. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. All right, who's immediately around him right now? It's in the throne room of heaven, right? He's to be held in reverence by all them. And among us is the congregation of the saints. We're to greatly fear him. Okay? And I know they say this several times. This is not the, the terrifying fear of that God's going to just squish me like a bug. But this is a recognition of the awesome power and might and glory that He has. He should be feared. We should dread, if we ever take His name in vain, we should dread that we have used such a mighty and noble and worthy name in such a sully and low form. Right? So we're in Psalm 89. Right? Greatly to be feared. Psalm 89, and we are in verse 7. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints to be had in reverence of all them that are about Him. No one can compare to Him. We need to fear Him. We need to hold Him in the high regard that He is. Verse 8, O Lord God of hosts, O Jehovah, Elohim of hosts, the eternal God, the mighty God of hosts, the God of armies, right? <laughs> it's all His. All the camps, all the hosts, they're all his. He is the chief, the top general, right? Oh, captain, my captain. Above all captains, that's him. Who is strong? Who is a strong Lord like unto thee? The answer is no one. There is no one who can compare to God's might or to thy faithfulness round about thee. Who is faithful, firm, trustworthy, stable like God? No one. There's no one in might. There's no one in faithfulness who else needs our love and devotion nobody that's right thou rulest the raging of the sea when the waves thereof arise thou stillest them do y'all know that Jesus calming the sea is pointing to his glory as God this is a messianic prophecy this points to the messiah You've got the raging of the sea. Who can control them? God alone. He spoke and there was calm. Now, 
You know the word mega? Greek word you get for extreme, right? So mega storm was going on. You know that same word mega appears when it describes the calm? There was a great storm, and then there was a mega calm. Not just, I, and the way I envision this, and I'm not sure exactly, is that it went from this crazy winds and storms and waves and sea to peace be still and it became like glass. Not a river, because the master said so. Not just the wind died down and things eventually kind of kept rocking along, like sometimes you've been on a boat and it's a little scary and then the wind goes. And, but it takes a while for it to calm down. I don't think it was like that. I think this was a great calm where the master spoke and it was so. Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves there arise, thou stillest them. Christ is demonstrating who he is there. Verse 10, thou hast broken Rahab. Who's Rahab? Well, literally it means the boasters, the proud, but it's an epitaph for Egypt. Shorthand. Right? We ever use a different word to describe some other country in shorthand? That's what this is doing. All right? So that proud country of Egypt says, you broke them. You, it's like you cut them in pieces. Like someone slain. Right? There's a pretty graphic story about someone who's uh, what's the word? It wasn't the wife, but it was the say again? Concubine. concubine, right? In the time of the judges, who um, he wound up cutting her in pieces because she had been slain, murdered, and sent a message throughout. Well, imagine in, vic- in a battle that you have be- defeated someone so badly that they're just cut in pieces. He said, "That's what you did to that country of Egypt." He's referring back to bringing the Exodus to being brought out. He says, "You, you just you." Destroyed them. You have broken Rahab in pieces, like taking a clay pot and just shattering it against the wall. Alright? You're not going to use that thing anymore, right? As one slain, thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. Boys, you ever get mad playing risk? Got all those little armies, right? You start to lose, what do you do with that game? <laughs> if you were like me as a child, you took your army, you whacked it off, and nobody's going to play, right? Could any of those armies stop my arm coming across there? No. They had no power in comparison. I just flipped that game board. I, I, man, I was a bad kid. Um, no one wanted to play games with me when I was little. Didn't understand why. Now I'm being a little bit more patient. But God's arm, he's that powerful. All the armies of the whole world put together. Line them all up. Put them like your wrist board. All of them together. There's not a thing they could do to withstand his arm or even say, what doest thou, right? All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Right? Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. The heavens are thine. All right, you look up, you see the stars, you see the moon, you see the sun. Infinite galaxies, right? Not infinite, but a large number of them. Because they're all gods. He owns them all. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. You're the creator. The earth, everything that's contained in it, every animal, every plant, every atom, you've created it all. It's all yours. An acknowledgement of the magnitude of God's glory as a creator. Since you own it, you you have divine possession of all things. Is there anything that's not God's? (laughs) Do we act like it? Well, God, I, I... here, you can have this little piece over here, but all oh, this is mine, and this is my time, and it's all his. Everything you have, everything you are, it's his already. How do you use it for your master's glory? The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them, created them. The north and the south, thou hast created them. Isn't that that's crazy? Just even the directions themselves, like the far north and the far, he's created it. They belong to him. Tabor and Hermon shall rejoice in thy name. You say, oh, that's kind of random names. Those are names of two mountains. And uh, you know, so you got mountains are praising God. Doesn't that make you a little ashamed? If the mountains are praising God and we're not? Go to Psalm uh, 148. Psalm 148. We're just going to read this. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise Him all His angels. Praise Him all His hosts. Praise Him, ye sun and moon. Praise Him all, ye stars of light. Praise ye, heaven of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded, and they were created. Right? Praise Him as the Creator God. 
Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He also hath established them forever and forever. He hath made a decree which shall not pass. Praise ye the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all deeps from the depths of the sea, fire and hail and snow and vapor, stormy wind, fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth, and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, young women, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is excellent. His name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and the heaven. He also exalteth the horn of His people. That horn is a symbol used to, to show the ability to, to rule, to have power. He exalteth the horn of His people and praise all of His saints. The praise of all the saints. He is the praise of all of His saints. Even unto the children of Israel, a people near unto Him, praise ye the Lord. You know, that verse, exalting the horn of His people, that, that, that's what's being discussed there in Revelation 5. Revelation 5, talking about being made kings and priests and will reign with Him. Revelation 5, let's see if I can find it real quick. No, oh, that's Romans. That won't help. <laughs> A little farther. Ten. Thank you. It's easier if I'm looking in the right book. <laughs> Revelation five ten, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. All that is by His His power, His might, for the glory of His name. Okay. Go back to Psalm 89. So that was Tabor and Hermon. So the mountains and the hills, they're all rejoicing in the name of the Lord. Do you have something to rejoice in this morning? Yes! You do. What if things are really hard right now? You still have something to rejoice in. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Remember, he told uh, the Israelites they were going to come out of Egypt with a high hand, all right? This is boldness, right? When you've got a low hand, you kind of, it's like I get the image of slipping something under the table, the underhanded thing, I don't really want to be seen, I'm just going to kind of slip out, my skin of my teeth, I'm going to get away. It's like, no, 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 no. When I bring you out of Egypt, it's, everyone's going to know what's happening. They're going to paid you to leave, right? You're spoiling them by giving all their stuff, and you're coming out with a mighty hand, and not a dog is going to move its tongue against this whole massive congregation. Right? That's the power that he has. He is bold. He is mighty. There is no one. He doesn't have to surreptitiously do anything to hide it from someone else, lest they could defeat it. Mm -mm. He's got the mighty hand, mighty arm, strong as his hand. What he wants to do, he does. Verse fourteen: Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. The throne of God is established, abides. On justice and judgment. Y'all, if that verse stopped there, we'd have a lot of trouble. One sin. One sin. That's enough for divine judgment and divine justice. For us to be worthy of being eternally cast into hell. And while we're there, all we could say is, Lord, you are good and right and just. And before that, we've got our original sin nature. So even the sins we add on to. He's not going to overlook sin. He can't. It would be contrary to who He is. He is just. All His ways are perfect. There's no iniquity found with Him. It would be sin for him to ignore our sin. His throne is, is established on justice and judgment. But what's going to go before his face? Mercy and truth. Truth. That is embodiment, that is embodied in Jesus Christ. He is God's infinite mercy, 
come down among us. He is truth. I am the truth. I mean, he even plainly said that. I am the truth. The way and the light. That mercy and truth proceeds. It goes before. Before we have to stand before that judgment seat, before that throne where judgment and justice reside, before we have to stand there, His mercy and His truth have gone before. Mm. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. A joyful sound, that means clamor, that means adoration. What do they have an adoration in? That mercy and truth that came before. You're blessed. If you know the joy of the victorious Savior, who we worship today because the tomb is empty. Right? Not a temporary thing. It wasn't, he wasn't stolen away. He didn't come back to life and then die later. Right? All the other resurrections, you say, well, how is he the firstborn? How is he the first one to be resurrected? There have been other people that have been brought back to the dead. He was unique in that he never died again. Lazarus, they had to pay for a second funeral. They already had the tomb, so, but they all died again. So he's the firstborn from the grave, like Adam was the first to cause. Death to pass upon. He's the first to have life everlasting. He's the first fruits of that. That's what we're looking forward to is being like Him with a resurrection that never ends. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. And they'll just be content in that joyfulness and they keep doing whatever they wanted to. No! They shall walk, O Lord, Jehovah, the eternal God, in the light of thy countenance. They will walk in the illumination that God's face gives. Jesus came into the world and He said that I am the light, right? And those that are walking after Him are walking in the night, in the light. But those who rejected Him, what? They didn't like Him because, because He was the light. They preferred to walk in the darkness for their deeds were evil. You see a reference to this over in, uh, in 1 John. 1 John, I think it's chapter 1. First John chapter 1, pick up in verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of Him, referring to Jesus, and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It is not enough to just have a head knowledge of what Christ has done. It's not enough. It should be reflected in our lives. And not just on Sunday morning. We have to walk in His light. And that walk involves everywhere that you go. Everywhere that you drive. Every conversation that you have. Your whole manner of life should be consistently striving to walk in the light that God's given and provided. Blessed. Supremely blessed. Blessed. Is that people that know the joyful sound, and they shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they rejoice. What should you rejoice in? The name of God. Just occasionally? All the day. All the day. In thy name they shall rejoice all the day. And in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. Y'all, we work so hard to lift up ourselves in this life. I want to have success here. I want to have this. I want pride. I want prestige. All these ways where we're trying to build up ourselves. How are we actually to be built up? In the righteousness of God Himself. Right? If you humble yourself before the Lord, 
He'll lift you up. Right? Does that mean you're going to get all the other garbage that comes in the world that we think that we need? No, probably not. If you do, it may be a trial sent for you. But you can be useful in God's service. It's His righteousness. In thy name will they rejoice all the day. And in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. For thou art the glory of their strength. Do you have any strength today? If you do, it's from God. He's the glory of it. He's the pinnacle. Sometimes, little boys, we like to flex our muscle, right? We have no muscle compared to God, right? He has got great glory, right? We should glory in His strength, right? I'm not saying it's bad to flex your muscle. I'm just saying in comparison to God... We have no muscles at all, right? For thou art the strength, thou art the glory of their strength, and in thy favor our horn shall be exalted. Right? And in thy favor our horn shall be exalted. So that reigning, it's only by God's favor. Right? For the Lord is our defense. That defense means a shield, means protector. It's not us. It's not our own strength. It's Him. For the Lord is our defense, our shield and protector. And remember, don't forget your context here. This is in the midst of terrible, terrible persecution. Right? So maybe the Ukrainian example didn't, didn't resonate with you. Maybe this is a time where it's now in this country, all those rights and freedoms that we enjoy have gone away. Right? And I, I don't honestly think that preaching Christ will ever become outlawed, but I think preaching the truths that He stood for certainly will. I think that if you say, this is a sin, well, that's going to become hate speech. And it will be censored, and it won't be visible on Facebook or YouTube or any of those other things. I can see that coming. There would be a time where I could go to jail for that. I could be fined for that. Okay? So let's say it's just in that scenario, am I whining and complaining and mully grubbing because things are hard, or am I still praising God and acknowledging that He's my strength? Any glory that's in the strength that I have that's been given, it's His glory. He's my deliverer. He's my defense. He is still my King. The Holy One of Israel is our King. The Holy One of Israel, that's, that's a shorthand for the Messiah. right? Even the demons recognize Jesus as the Messiah, right? Over in uh, Mark, i got 124 written there, but won't turn there. But, you know, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou uh, of Nazareth? We know who thou art, the Holy One of God. The demons even recognized him. But is that enough? No. You believe us in God, you'll do us well. But even the demons do and tremble. Right? That's faith without works. Huh? Next week. Right? For the Lord is our defense. In the midst of tribulation, the Lord is still our defense. We still have something to rejoice in. He is our king. Right? It's not any political oversight here that you could imagine. The best one that you could possibly have, he's still not our king. He alone is our King. Jesus Christ is our King. It is fine. It is okay to address Him as King Jesus. If anything, sometimes that will put us in a better frame of mind of just who are we speaking to and speaking in the name of and speaking on behalf. If you and I are ambassadors for a King, ambassadors have to be very careful today. right? The role of the ambassador is represent your government at home. You're abroad. right? So if you've got an ambassador over here from, let's say, Russia... He's having a real hard time, right? Some of them actually have been kicked out and sent home because they were spies. Neither here nor there. But you and I, we're an ambassador for our king. And we're abroad. And so this land that we live in, this is not our land. You know, like in the embassy, you know, the embassy, the, the ground that it sits on, is actually part of the home country. Yeah, they control over it. It's a little spot where we come. This is God. Now, God owns all of it, obviously. But this is His. And when we're out in the world, wherever it is, we're representing Him as His ambassadors. And ambassadors, do they get to speak for themselves? Well, this is what I think we ought to do. Ambassadors' opinion don't matter at all. The only people thing listen to is, what is He saying on behalf of the government? And He has to be told that. He can't just guess. He can get fired if He tries that. We're speaking on behalf of our king when we're out in the world, that we need to be representing his interests, his words, and faithfully speaking on his behalf. 
The Holy One of Israel is our King. Verse 19, Then thou spakest in a vision to thy Holy One, and said, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of his people. So again, he's t- telling what God has done. God spoke to, to his one in a vision. I believe that's David, you know, literally David here. I have laid health upon one that is mighty. David was a mighty man. Right? When Absalom is, is trying, his son is trying to overthrow him and he's getting the counsel back and forth, one would say, uh, we know that David is like a mighty man, so either we need to go take him out now and, and God defeated that good counsel and said, no, he's a mighty man, so he's going to be like a bear who's been robbed of its whelps. Right? You, you take the cubs from a mama bear, is she going to be a little irate? Yeah, he's saying, that's how your daddy is going to be. You best not mess with him now. Go get your whole army and then get him. And that was of the Lord to defeat the council. But David was a mighty man already from God. And here it says, I've laid help upon him. He's laid more help upon the mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. That chosen, that's elect, select. They've chosen him. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him coin of the oil by Samuel, with whom my hand shall be established. My arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the sons of wickedness afflict him. But I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. This is all the promises that he's given to David as a natural king that he would fulfill in David's kingship and his rule over natural Israel. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. That goes back to verse 1, right? I'll sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known the faithfulness to all generations. He promised my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. Right? It's a promise. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. So David was a king after God's own heart. That's how I described him. He was the best king and he was exalted for Israel's natural sake because he was following God the closest. Right? He was putting God first. He was glorifying his name. In my name shall his horn be exalted. So his rule and his authority um, shall be grown, shall be expanded. I will set his hand also in the sea. All right, so imagine in your map, you're standing at Jerusalem. Over on the left hand, you've got the Mediterranean Sea. It says, I'm going to put his hand in the sea and his other hand in the rivers, right hand in the rivers. So you've got the Jordan River over here. And if you reach forward a little bit, you've got the Euphrates Rivers. And those are the dimensions of the Canaan land that God told Moses all the way back in the day that from the sea to the river to the great river is where your land is going to be. So I'm giving that to David. I'm exalting it by my name. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. So David, as a mighty king in all this great, wonderful times, after he'd gone through really terrible afflictions, right? He spent many, many a day camped in the woods in the wilderness with Saul trying to kill him. But eventually, when he got to enjoy the blessings of the Lord and being there ruling in his name, um, you know, he's crying. He's acknowledging that it all came from God. That's my Father, my God, the rock of my salvation. Right? Well, who's also going to use those terms? Jesus as David is a, a type for Jesus. Right? Good king, perfect king. He would be praying to God in his earthly ministry. He'd be praying as my Father, my Father, my Father. Until that moment on the cross. My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? And that's when we understand that God had put all the sins of all his people on Jesus as that scapegoat. The sin bearer. The one who knew no sin, who became sin for you. To pay the sin debt that you had accrued, that I had accrued, that we could not pay. And for which we deserve to be cast into hell. And it would be right and just and holy if God chose to do that. But instead, he put it upon his son. And so that close relationship that the son had with the father, of being addressing him as my father, changed to, my God. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, we know that he did not leave him in that condition. We know that he didn't leave him in the grave. He took his life back. And he ascended up on high, and he lives, and he reigns today. And Christ is our rock. He is the rock of our salvation. You know the rock? Symbolism there? Firmness? Faithfulness, He is firm. He is faithful. He is dependable. He doesn't change. And the rock of my salvation. Verse 27, I will make him my firstborn. Firstborn, that's that's prized position. Right? 
then, you know, they got a double portion of the inheritance. They were the ones who, you know, he would have the right to, to be king. Firstborn, right? David, tight for Christ, right? Made him higher than the kings of the earth. Jesus, God's firstborn, the first begotten, was raised. All things were put under his feet. The king of all kings, Lord of all lords. That's where he is. That's where he's been raised to. My mercy will I keep or guard or protect for him forevermore. And my covenant shall stand fast with him. So again, we're talking about David, that he's made these promises to him. He says, my mercy will I keep forevermore. And my covenant shall stand with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. So without ending, his throne is going to go on. And again, that will be completed by Jesus Christ taking that throne and reigning on it today. Okay? If, verse 30, if his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. We read that back in 17, right? That if your descendants of David disobey, he will chasten them. Just like he chastens us as his children today. As a loving father, he chastens us. No? I don't think it is right to use the expression punishing. God is punishing me because I did such and such. There was a, there was a bad accident over here. Somebody was turning and, and they got popped and the car flipped over and went and talked to this guy. Um, he was okay, um, but the other guy wasn't. But um, I'm sitting in the back of the ambulance talking to this guy and he says, you know, God's punishing me. You know, I, I, I did something and we'll get into that. And uh, Anyway, and so we tried to, to talk through that concept a little bit and we got to the point where he had pagan beliefs and believed Lucifer is reigning today and quickly got <laughs> to, a, to an impasse. But God does not punish you in the way that we mean you're sitting before the throne of judgment and he is sending out retribution equal to what you deserve. But rather, he's correcting you like a gentle, loving father. The judge at sentencing time is coming to hand down a fair sentence for your crime. Your father wants to teach you to know right from wrong, and to give you enough incentive not to repeat it. Now, if you're slow like me, often I had to have repeat lessons. But one desires to build you up and make you a better man or woman, and the other is just passing the judgment that's fit for the crime. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant will stand fast. His seed will I make to endure forever, and his throne is the days of heaven. So he's, he's saying that this covenant is faithful. It's promised. It's not going to stop even if they disobey. But if they do disobey and they break my commandments, then I will visit their transgression with the rod. That rod's the image of, of the Father coming with that stick. Right? And their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness, my mercy, my tenderness will I not utterly take away from him nor suffer or permit my faithfulness to fail. He's not going to take away his mercies. He's not going to take away his faithfulness. It will both remain firm. He won't utterly take them away. Will it feel the same way? No. But it won't be utterly taken away. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie Unto David, y'all ever been confused by that passage in Hebrew about Jesus, about God uh, swearing by two immutable things? Right? Here's an example. He is swearing by his own holiness that he will not lie, which God cannot lie. Right? It would be defeating of himself. You got all these unchanging things that, even in the context of natural men, if you were to make a, a swear, a promise, um, and it wouldn't be annulled immediately, that it would stand. Well, he said, God's doing that. So he's taking it, not just a statement, but he's swearing. What is he swearing by? The only thing that he can swear by, the best thing. His own holiness, that he's not going to lie to David. And what's all this not lie about? Is that his mercies and his faithfulness are going to endure forever. Do y'all have something to rejoice in this morning? 
Right? Once have I sworn by my holiness, I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, his throne as the sun. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. A faithful witness in heaven. Now, he's using the imagery there of the sun and the moon. Of, of, have, have those ever not come up? There's been a time when God kind of paused the dial for a minute, but they always come up. They've been pretty faithful. Regardless of what's going on in the world, the sun and the moon are still there. He's saying that that's how faithful it is. And you have a faithful witness in heaven. Now, on one hand, let's point the sun and the moon. Do you have a faithful witness in heaven right now? Sitting on the right hand of the Father, advocating on your behalf. Saying, that one's mine. Not only can you hear his prayers, but he stands clean with my righteousness put upon him. He's sworn by his own holiness that he won't withdraw his mercy and his faithfulness. And he's given a witness in heaven, a testimony. Someone who's given testimony in heaven on your behalf. So whenever you see the sun and the moon, don't worship them, but be reminded there's something in heaven. It's as unending as the moon and sun. As long as this world is going to be here, they'll be here. When it's wrapped up, they'll be wrapped up. But you have something in heaven now that is witnessing to your Father on, on your behalf. All right, so this is a time of great trials and tribulations, and we spent 37 verses on praise, on acknowledgement of who God is and acknowledgement of what He said. And then we get to the troubles. But, but thou hast cast off and abhorred. To abhor is to, to hate, to feel wrath. Thou hast been wroth with thine anointed. This is referring to Israel. And again, I think this most likely is being written from the period of captivity where the nation of Judah has been conquered by the Babylonians. They've taken them out and plucked them and put them somewhere else. You know, it spread throughout um, the nation of Babylon. Right? So like said a minute ago, the modern day illustration by Russia coming into Ukraine, conquering them, taking those Ukrainians back to Russia, which they're doing right now. And then this is that Ukrainian in Russia worshiping God. So I spent all this time, 37 verses, praising God, acknowledging God, acknowledging His promises, and now I'm, I'm saying, here's what's going on. You have cast off. You have abhorred. You have been wroth with thine anointed. Because, well, if you disobey, He was going to bring a rod, right? Thou hast made void or rejected the covenant of thy servant and hast profaned His crown by casting it to the ground. This is the Psalms' perspective. The covenant has not been made void in the way that we would use as a legal term, but it has no longer has force. But he's saying, we don't have a king sitting on the throne right now. It feels like you've broken it. He's wrong. He hasn't broken it, but it could feel like that. Thou hast broken down all his hedges. All right, and so there's illustrations and, and this kind of running metaphor for vineyards in the Old Testament. Right? You've got your vineyard, and you put a hedge of protective to put around it. And that keeps the animals from coming in and eating it, from the hogs coming in and tearing it up, from the thieves coming in and stealing and throwing it up. He says, you took that hedge of protection that you had around Israel, and you've taken it down. You've broken it down. Thou hast brought his strongholds to ruin, those, those mighty cities with the great towers and walls that were supposed to keep the enemies out. He said, you've let them go to, to nothing. They've been ruined. All that pass by the way spoil him. It's not just you know the really strong and mighty, just anybody who comes along. They can whoop them. Right? Judah, who had become, who had been such a mighty force, naturally, had been reduced to just a laughing stock. Right? Anybody, the loosest, the worst little warrior, he can come and he can just whoop up on you. And that's how badly they had been brought low. He is a reproach to his neighbors. Another way of saying that, he was an embarrassment. <laughs> right? They're supposed to be this mighty nation. We used to pay them tribute. Now look at them. They're just embarrassing him. They're just, let's. When you curse, just use their name. It's the same thing as being sorry and low down. And worthless is a reproach. Thou hast set up the right hand of his adversaries. Lord, you've allowed his enemies to be strong. You've set up their right hand. Thou hast made all his enemies to rejoice. What are they rejoicing in? In kicking your tail. Right? This is hard times. This is not just in theory things are kind of rough. This is bad. And yet he still spent all that time praising Worshipping, 
Acknowledging God's truth and God's promises. Thou hast set up the right hand of his adversaries. From 42, thou hast made all his enemies to rejoice. Thou hast turned the edge of his sword and not made him to stand in the battle. So you imagine them bringing that sword down as a blow to just strike off your enemy's head. It's like you've kind of deflected that. And so all my blows are just glancing blows. Even as hard as I'm fighting, I'm not making any progress. I'm just continuing to be whooped up on. You've turned the edge of his sword. Thou hast not made him to stand in the battle. Remember, Lord, the little battle of Ai, right? They said, we don't need to send the whole company. This is when they first came in to Canaan. We don't need to send everybody. Just send a few. It's just a little town. We'll just whoop up on them, right? And they would. And somebody had disobeyed God. It was Achan, right? He'd stolen something from Jericho. And what happened to that, that battle? Could they stand? No, they turned tail and ran. Right? What's the difference between them being able to stand and running? God. He's saying here that you're not allowing us to stand anymore. You've not made them to stand in the battle. So they're running. They're fleeing. Thou hast made his glory to cease and cast his throne down to the ground. So the throne that you promised David has been thrown down to the ground. There was no king during the captivity. There had been a series of puppet kings there at the end. You know, one had his eyes blinded. One was put into captivity. One was taken to Egypt and he died there. So it's just a series of bad things. Eventually, there's no one sitting on the throne in Judah anymore. The days of his youth hast thou shortened. And that youth is an illustration for, for the time of prosperity, the strength and vigor. It says you, that strong time has come to an end, and now we're in the time where we're, we're weak and we're frail. You shortened him. Thou hast covered him with shame. Selah. Selah is to, 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 to pause. You know, something our, our vernacular would say, chew on it. Well, think on that a minute. All these great and precious promises, and yet things are really, really hard right now. Really bad. It looks really bleak. And then it shifts to the third part of the psalm where he's asking for something. He's pleading. He's begging. Lord, how long, Lord? How long? How much longer? Wilt thou hide thyself forever? And that's human talk, right? We get so down at times, just, Lord, are you ever going to get me out of this? How long will thou hide thyself forever? Shalt thy wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. Wherefore hast thou made all men in vain? Saying, Lord, our entire lives are just a vapor. It's just a short, short, short time. Is my life... You know, that worthless. What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? He said, we're all going to die. We've only got a short amount of time. Lord, how long? How long until you come? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Is there any man alive who can stop himself from going into the grave? Who can deliver his soul from out of the grave? One. That's right. Christ. Christ was able to deliver himself from the grave. Is there any man that liveth and shall not see death? Yeah! Jesus Christ lives and reigns today and he won't see death. Not again. Did he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Yes! Did the psalmist understand that? I think he was probably just complaining. But Christ can fulfill those things. Has God made all men in vain? Was it just a worthless exercise? No! His faithfulness and His mercy will endure forever. Right. Lord, where are Thy loving former? Where are Thy former loving kindnesses? Where are the mercies that we used to know, which Thou swearest unto David in Thy truth? Lord, remember, Lord, the reproach of Thy servant. How I do bear in my bosom the reproach of the mighty. He said, Lord, I'm struggling here. Remember me. Remember the reproach that I'm under. Lord, I've heard about your former loving kindnesses, which you swear unto David in thy truth. He wants to see him, right? He's asking for relief from his current afflictions. I bear in my bosom the reproach of all the mighty people, wherewith thine enemies have reproached, O Lord, wherewith they have reproached the footsteps of thine anointed. His enemies are, are bearing shame, Towards his people, bearing shame towards 
his anointed. They're reproaching and they're costing them out as vile. Wherewith thine enemies have reproached, O Lord, wherewith they have reproached the footsteps of thine anointed. Y'all feel like our culture reproaches the footsteps of Christ? Like his actual ones, not like the made up fairy tale ones where it, you know there's no meat or substance. They do. They hate it. His enemies, if anything, feel like they're winning. But it's just for a time. And we know that His mercies and His faithfulness will endure. And in His good time, He will show His enemies where they truly stand. And He will bless those that rejoice in the sound of His righteousness uh, with an inheritance that they cannot unfathom. You know, the meek shall inherit the earth, right? How does it end? In the midst of all this trial, in the midst of all this tribulation, in the request for the Lord to fulfill the promises that He's made, blessed, blessed be the Lord forevermore. God, worthy to be adored, our adored Father, we bless You. You're blessed. You're worthy of blessings. You're worthy of praise. You're worthy of honor. And that's not contingent upon what's going on here and now because the picture's so much bigger than that. He hasn't forgotten you. And He won't ever. He's already made provision for you from before the foundation of the world and through the expiration of the world. The world's got an expiration date. And you have an inheritance, a house built, not made with hands, right? That eternal body that will be with Him in glory. It has no expiration. It's uncorruptible. He's made provision for you by His mercy and His loving kindness. So you have something to rejoice in this morning and every morning. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. May we raise our view of how high and mighty and wonderful our God is and dwell a little bit more on His righteousness, on His faithfulness, on His mercy, upon His attributes. We talk about those four buckets in prayer. Y'all, you've got a lot of material to be working on as you're praising God. There's no shortage there. You'll ever go to a performance interview and you're trying really hard to think of something nice about the employee that you're reviewing. There's just so so many things you can say, right? This is not the case. You've got an infinite character and quality and pureness and holiness of your great God that you can come and you can spend some time dwelling with Him as you're praying, praying in worship and thanksgiving for what He's done, and then spend that little bit of time on those requests for you and the requests for others. The physical things, guess what? We're going to have physical things the whole time we're here in this life. But we have a body that's going to be prepared for us. Ours will be changed to this body and it won't have those. Those are just a fleeting thing. Just like hunger and pain and sorrow, those are all going to pass away. We spend a lot of time and energy on those little temporal things. When you're worshiping God, you're dwelling on the eternal. Those things will always be true. Those things are worthy of your time and your attention, and He's worthy of our affection. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. That's what we're going to be doing in heaven. You want to, what, what's heaven going to be like? Praising God without hindrance, without distraction. Sometimes you get sleepy while I'm preaching, right? It won't be like that in heaven. You'll be able to praise God perfectly. Blessed be the Lord, Jehovah, the eternal God, forevermore. Amen. So let it be. And amen. So let it be. Amen. Anybody have a number you'd like to sing in closing?